Four armed robbers entered a bank in Argentina and took hostages. The police surrounded the place, and after several hours of negotiation, the thieves announced that they would surrender themselves on the condition that the police bring them pizza. Surprising, right? Well, the pizza arrived, but the thieves suddenly cut off all channels of communication with the police. The police decided to storm the bank, but inside the bank, there was no one except the hostages, and when they went downstairs, the bank's safe was in flames, and there was no trace of the thieves, nor any trace of the way in which they escaped. The police immediately turned their attention to the hostages. They suspected that the thieves were hiding among the hostages. Is it true that the thieves were hiding among the hostages? Exactly where did they go? In 2006, the largest bank robbery in Argentina took place. A smart and complex operation beyond description. The robbers who executed this operation were four. The first was the leader, named Fernando. The second was the engineer of the operation, named Sebastian. The third was named Beto de la Torre, and we'll refer to him as the financier. And the fourth was known as the silence, whom we'll call the violent one. There were also two people who assisted them from outside. Their identities remain unknown. The first was referred to as the doctor, and the second as the boy. We want you to keep the names of these four in mind, and we gave each one of them a title, so that it would be easy for you to remember them. The story begins with Fernando, the leader who masterminded the operation. This man entered a psychiatrist one day and told him, I want to rob a bank. The doctor was just surprised that Fernando was saying such things. Then the psychiatrist asked, okay, so where did you get this desire? Because you want money? Fernando replied, no, I don't need money, but you know me. I am an artistic person and I love art and I feel that I can create a great work of art in the field of bank robberies. The psychiatrist said, good, and how do you intend to carry out this operation? Fernando replied to him and said, I don't know now, but this topic is taking over my entire mind and being. I think about it before going to sleep and after I wake up and every moment of my day, I wanna rob a bank. The psychiatrist brushed Fernando off, believing that the hashish was influencing Fernando's thoughts. But Fernando actually intended to rob a bank and was going to carry out the smartest and largest bank robbery in the Argentine capital, Buenos Aires. Later, Fernando found a bank called Banco Rio, one of the well-known banks that is located in a very rich area, meaning a bank where the rich keep their possessions, money, and valuables. Fernando sat thinking about the ways in which he could carry out the operation. The first way is that when the bank is open, they enter the bank with their weapons, take the money available from the tellers, and leave quickly before the police get to the place. However, the drawback of this strategy is that it is very risky and even the rewards are meager because they will not have enough time to visit the vault and take what is inside. They must get out quickly before the police arrive. The second method is to break into the bank when it is closed. This method typically involves digging an underground tunnel to reach the vault. However, there's a major drawback. Banks are equipped with temperature sensors and state-of-the-art alarms. These can quickly detect if someone is inside the vault while it's closed making it easier for the attempt to be exposed. Fernando reasoned that since both strategies are challenging and extremely risky, he should at least aim for the larger rewards if he was gonna take such a chance. This means that he would implement the second method. He would dig a tunnel and enter the vault when the bank was closed. He wanted to think about how he could dig a tunnel. Initially, he planned to rent a ground floor apartment or a warehouse near the bank and excavate a tunnel that would connect to the safe from below ground but Fernando ended up receiving a very pleasant surprise. After doing his reconnaissance rounds one day, he noticed the sewer openings that were located along the street in front of the bank. Approximately every 10 meters, there was a sewage hole, which meant that there was an underground passage that ran in front of the bank. Until it reached the sewage drain's mouth, the tunnel followed these openings along the street. This expansive opening was situated approximately 150 meters from the bank, indicating that Fernando had a tunnel that was already constructed. Along the way, Fernando entered this drainage tunnel and began to explore it. At first, the tunnel was square, but after he had walked about 100 meters, he reached a circular tunnel with a diameter of about 6 meters. Now Fernando needed someone to help him, because it was impossible for him to carry out this operation entirely on his own. It came to mind that one of his friends was called Sebastian Poster, and we called him an engineer because this man was an expert in electronics and mechanical science. Fernando presented the idea to him, and Sebastian was surprised because, according to what he knew, Fernando had no criminal past and no experience in matters of theft. All that was known about him was that he loved art and hashish. 
So how could someone like this intend to rob a bank? But Fernando told him the details and the idea he had in mind and how they could reach the safe through the underground sewer tunnel. For a moment, Sebastian thought seriously about the matter. Even though he had never stolen anything in his life, he thought about entering this field and the history of his family with the banks was as bad as it could be. During a period of time, the banking system in Argentina collapsed, resulting in the loss of a significant amount of money and savings of his grandfather's father and many others. Sebastian started to consider the situation from the perspective that the bank was the villain in this scenario, and that if he ever took anything from the bank, it would only be something moral. The engineer, Sebastian, told Commander Fernando that he was with him in the operation. Then, together, they went to the bank site, to the sewer tunnel underneath it, and together, they began to make calculations. They knew exactly where they were going to dig. First of all, Fernando went and got measuring tapes and started to lower them into the sewer openings. They were able to accurately determine their destination and complete the distance they had traveled from the ground by utilizing these tapes when they entered the drainage tunnel. Next, they entered the bank and captured a series of concealed photographs. Pretending to be new customers, they visited the basement where the safe deposit boxes were located to gather information. They estimated the area of the vault and counted the number of safety deposit boxes inside. Although they discovered there were hundreds of boxes, all their calculations were still approximations. They needed more accurate data. They needed precise figures which meant accessing the bank's blueprints likely stored in the National Archives. However, they also faced a challenge, securing financial support for the tools Sebastian, the engineer, planned to create. As they would require significant funding, Fernando, began searching for a new partner to join their team. He reached out to someone known only as the Doctor. The Doctor's true identity was never revealed, and he primarily served as a coordinator rather than being directly involved in the operation. He assured Fernando that he would connect him with the right contacts to aid in their mission. The first connection was the financier. Although he had a criminal record and connections to the underworld, he lacked direct experience with thefts. However, he was well versed in the world of weapons. The commander, Fernando, along with the doctor, went to meet the financier. When they met, Fernando explained the idea to him, and he was excited to enter the operation as soon as she heard it. However, he replied, honestly, I don't have any money, but I have a truck that I can sell, and with its money, I can finance the operation. Thus, he became the third main member of the gang. As we said, the doctor's identity remained unknown and he did not participate directly in the operation. He was just a coordinator. Fernando needed a fourth person to help with the heavy manual labor since Sebastian, the engineer, would be busy making tools and handling some family matters. The doctor suggested bringing in Louis, who they called Violent Louis. Louis was a tough guy with a past in crime and had spent time in prison. He was known for being quick to anger and not afraid to get physical. But Louis wasn't just about strength. He was also smart and good at lying and tricking people which would make him important for their plan. By now, the gang was complete. Fernando, the leader, Sebastian, the engineer, Beto de la Torre, the financier, and Louis, the violent one. These four wanted to discuss the details of the operation. They went down together into the sewer tunnel to see the place and examine the calculations that Fernando and Sebastian had made. The next step was clear. They needed to confirm these calculations and obtain the building plans of the bank. The doctor told them, I will get you these plans. They asked him, how will you get them? And indeed, after a few days, he brought the plans and placed them in front of the group. To this day, they do not know how he managed to acquire them. After that, they calculated exactly where they needed to dig inside the sewer tunnel, according to the length of the tunnel and the angle at which it should be inclined. They drew a detailed plan with all the calculations needed for the digging process. Then they wanted to bring the tools they needed an electric generator that runs on diesel, drilling tools, and large trailers. They started digging on the side of the tunnel. There was always someone up on the street to monitor the situation and make sure that the sound of the drilling did not reach the surface. Of course, this digging process would take at least several months. Then they had to solve the next problem. Sensors. Thermal sensors and alarms posed a major problem. They could easily detect their body heat and trigger an alert. The gang needed a way to hide their heat signatures from these sensors. 
They considered using special suits made of fabric similar to what campers and mountain climbers use for insulation. To test the idea, Fernando bought a thermal camera and started experimenting to see if it would still capture his body temperature through the suit. But the plan had its risks. The suit wasn't a guaranteed solution, especially since they would be moving around a lot inside the vault with various tools and objects that the sensors could detect. The whole operation felt dangerously uncertain. Fernando, as the leader, became increasingly frustrated, struggling to find a foolproof way to bypass the sensors and enter the safe without setting off alarms. The risk was high, and the solution remained elusive. Then, one day, a wild idea hit Fernando. Up until that point, their focus had been on robbing the bank while it was closed digging in from below without being seen. Though Fernando had briefly considered an armed break-in, he knew that would likely end with the police quickly surrounding the place. But this new idea, it combined both approaches, the tunnel and the armed intrusion. Instead of using the tunnel to get inside, they would use it as their escape route. With this plan, they wouldn't need to worry about sensors or alarms inside the bank. Once the police inevitably surrounded the building, they would have no idea the thieves were already slipping away underground. When the idea struck Fernando, he was ecstatic. He immediately began scouring the internet to see if anyone had ever tried something like this before, but it seemed no one had. He felt like he might be the first to think of such a brilliant escape. This idea amazed and excited the group when Fernando shared it. Subsequently, they started incorporating the necessary weapons and equipment. A gangster and experienced weapon handler, the financier said he would handle the weapons, but the weapons were special. Keep watching to find out what's unique about them. The entire preparation took nearly a year to complete. During that time, the gang not only finished digging the tunnel, but also constructed a small dam inside the sewer. The dam had a specific purpose, to raise the water level just enough so they could use small rubber boats. They knew that after the heist, they wouldn't be able to carry all the loot on foot, especially with half their bodies submerged in water. Moving that way would be slow and cumbersome. By raising the water level, the boats would allow them to transport the stolen goods much more easily through the tunnel, ensuring a quicker escape. The dam was crucial to making sure the water was deep enough for the boats to glide comfortably. Initially, the plan was to flee towards the sewer mouth and exit there, but then they realized that as soon as the police figured out what was happening, they would head directly to the sewer exit and could block their escape route. So they studied an alternative route, moving in the opposite direction of the sewer mouth. They discovered this route was much better because it had hundreds of openings along the tunnel. These openings were located every 10 meters. After studying this opposite route, they identified a specific opening from which they would emerge, an opening about 200 meters away from the bank site. They decided to bring a van and park it above this sewer opening. They would create an aperture in the van's floor directly above the sewer opening. This meant that they could emerge from the sewer straight into the vehicle without anyone seeing them. The financier had acquired a small truck, and the gang gathered there to modify it. Their task was to cut a hatch into the truck's floor, creating a hidden exit for their escape plan. As they worked, the financier's wife, Alyssa, the mother of his daughter, unexpectedly walked in. Startled, the gang turned to the financier and asked, What's your wife doing here? He waved it off, saying, No, no, it's fine. Don't worry, everything's under control. This brief encounter was the first and only time the gang met Alyssa. Alyssa had a key role in the heist, she would be the one driving the truck and waiting for them until the operation was complete. Everything was nearly set. The only challenge left was figuring out how to break open the hundreds of safety deposit boxes inside the vault and fast. Opening them manually wasn't an option. It would take far too long and time was not on their side. The engineer came up with a solution, a hydraulic tool they called the cannon. This device could destroy a safety deposit box in just seven seconds. However, it could only handle one box at a time, but it was fast enough for the job. After months of meticulous planning and hard work, everything was finally in place. The sewer tunnel was ready for their entry with the boats, and the escape route had been expertly dug, leading straight to the bank. The vault, situated about 200 meters away in the bank's basement, was filled with safety deposit boxes, just waiting to be opened. With all the pieces in position, they were set to move forward with the final stage of their operation. Their escape plan involved a van positioned over the sewer opening, featuring an open floor for quick access. The gang decided to execute the operation on January 13, 2006. Only Sebastian, the engineer, entered the sewer tunnel next to the boats. The small inflatable was ready, stocked with tools, including the crucial cannon. 
Sebastian made his way through the tunnel until he reached the wall of the bank. Once there, he settled in, waiting for the signal from his colleagues. Meanwhile, the leader, Fernando, along with the financier and the violent Louis, were gathered above, finalizing their plans. In front of the bank door, with everything set and everyone in position, the gang burst in, weapons drawn. They swiftly took control of the situation, forcing customers and the workers inside, ordering them to lie flat with their faces down. Meanwhile, the bank guard in the control room opened the door and alerted the police. It didn't take long for patrols to arrive, as they were stationed nearby. This was when Fernando kicked off the carefully orchestrated plan he had dubbed the Coco Plan. The idea was to grab one of the hostages and make a dramatic show of trying to escape through the bank's entrance, only to turn back inside once he was seen by the police. It was a risky move, but Fernando was determined to create confusion and buy his team more time. The police surrounded the place. This move was meant to make the police think they were escaping before they arrived. They even placed a fake car in front of the bank by the door, but they returned to the bank quickly once they saw the place was surrounded. The operations commander assumed that the thieves were trapped and had no way out. The thieves inside the bank were in control of the situation, except for one thing, the guard, who had locked himself inside the control room. They had to get him out of the room somehow, because he was in direct communication with the police. If the guard saw them leaving the bank at any time, he would inform the police and they would intervene. So, it became a matter of negotiating. The violent Louis told the guard that nothing would happen to him, but if he didn't open the door, things could escalate. The guard refused to give in. Louis then took one of the bank employees and put a gun to her head, threatening the guard that if he didn't come out, he would kill her. The guard remained firm, refusing to surrender, but the employee, whom Louis was holding, began to cry. She knew the guard, as they had worked together. She begged him to come out, saying she wanted to see her daughter again. The guard, unable to ignore her plea, finally relented. He said, that's it, I'll come out, but don't hurt anyone. The guard opened the door, placed his weapon on the table, and surrendered to the thieves. The violent Lewis searched him from head to toe and took his phone away. He then ordered him to walk outside. The guard, confused, asked if he was allowed to leave. Yes, Lewis confirmed. The guard walked out hands raised toward the police and special forces surrounding the bank. He briefed them about the situation inside, telling them that there were three armed men and around 30 hostages inside the bank. In addition, he reported that he observed one of the masked robbers pointing outside while holding a phone. At the same time, Fernando called the engineer, Sebastian, who was waiting in the tunnel outside the vault's wall. Fernando gave the order to break into the wall and Sebastian began digging. As Sebastian worked, he heard the sound of a cabinet being moved on the other side. Every moment, he feared they had dug in the wrong spot, but eventually, the engineer entered the vault with the hydraulic equipment and began working. Over the course of two hours, they aimed to open as many boxes as possible, estimating that they could open around 400 boxes. During these two hours, Sebastian, the engineer, and Fernando, the commander, remained below in the safe, carrying out the looting operation. Meanwhile, above, the violent Louis and financier took control of the hostages. Two hours passed, which was determined by the violent Louis. He was the one holding the phone, and as we told you, he had a talent for acting and deception. He had a strange style of stalling the police, creating a character for himself that became famous even in the media, which was covering the event from the beginning. They called him the owner of the gray suit. Even the operations commander, when he called him, was surprised at how this person spoke to them. The operations commander asked, What are your demands? What do you want? Lewis, known for his violent tendencies, replied with surprising candor, We came here to rob the bank, but things didn't go as planned. Everyone scattered, and before we knew it, you surrounded us. We don't want to hurt anyone, but we're in a tight spot now. Through his binoculars from the bank window, the commander observed Louis, sitting calmly in a chair, one leg crossed over the other, staring back with an unsettling serenity. This calmness unnerved the commander as he considered the situation. Interrupting his thoughts, Louis continued, Listen, my buddy Tony and I just got out of Sheikah prison after 15 long years. This is my first time robbing a bank. I know how things work. If this escalates, it won't end well for anyone. As for the hostages, don't worry about them. We'll decide when to let them go. Greed is not a good look, my friend. So don't get too ambitious. Okay, bye. With that, Louis held the phone firmly showcasing his control over the situation and forcing the commander to reconsider any rash decisions. 
All the thieves needed was a little time. In a twist of irony, Louis and his financier discovered that one of the hostages, an elderly woman, was celebrating her birthday that day. They went to the small kitchen attached to the bank, brought her a little cake, and sat singing happy birthday to her. They left all the hostages lying on the floor, but in the end, they told her that they were going to give her a birthday gift, which was her release. They actually took her out the door and let her go. This story was mentioned by several sources, but it was strange. In any case, the communication between the violent Louis and the operations commander continued, and each time Louis invented a new story or something to keep them occupied. One time, he told them to call a lawyer. He gave them a phone number that belonged to one of the hostages, pretending it was the lawyer's number. When the police called this number, which was supposed to be the lawyer's, Louis answered himself, changed his voice, and pretended to be the lawyer. He sat there negotiating, stalling them. This man was in a strange state, managing to stall the police easily for the two hours they needed to complete the operation. When the two hours were over, unfortunately, the engineer Sebastian and the commander Fernando found that the situation had heated up, making it difficult to work as efficiently as they had expected. However, the loot they had obtained was still enormous, more than enough for them. So they decided not to risk more and stick to the time they had set for themselves, avoiding letting greed blind them. Commander Fernando called the violent Louis and told him that they would now start their escape plan from the bank. Here, Louis played his last trick against the police. He called the operations commander and said, look, we are ready to surrender ourselves now, but we know we'll be in detention without food for a long time. Before we surrender, we want pizza. The commander agreed and Louis told him, we want authentic Italian pizza and gave them the name of a restaurant very far from the bank to buy more time. The operations commander in disbelief agreed to get the pizza. After this conversation, Louis cut off all communications with the police. Meanwhile, Fernando and Sebastian, who were in the safe, collected all the loot in bags and removed these bags through the tunnel. They crawled out and quickly spread a small mattress on the floor, laying their weapons on it. They knew the story was nearing its climax, yet the reasons behind their choices lingered in the air. After ensuring everything was in place, they slipped through the hole in the wall and pushed the chest of drawers back into position, concealing their escape route. Carefully, they placed what looked like a bomb over the opening, ensuring their exit remained undetected. Next, they hurried down to the small rubber boats waiting below. They loaded the bags of stolen goods onto one boat, securing them tightly and tied a rope between the two boats for stability. With urgency, they maneuvered through the narrow sewer tunnel, the darkness closing in around them as they followed the path to freedom. Finally, they reached the staircase leading up to the surface. Clutching their bags, they climbed to the top, emerging into the night, where a getaway car sat idling, ready to speed them away from the chaos they had left behind. The van and its driver were waiting for them. They put the bags through the hole in the floor of the van, and the car was large enough for both the thieves and the substantial amount of bags they were carrying. They drove away without anyone seeing them. They headed to the safe house they had prepared before, and when they arrived, the van entered the garage and dropped off the bags of spoils. First, they turned on the TV to watch the news to inform them of the situation and whether the police were following them. What was amusing was that the police hadn't even entered the bank yet and the gang was watching the TV in silence, monitoring the events. After a while, when the pizza Louis had ordered arrived, the police tried to communicate with him more than once, but all these communication attempts failed. The commander then decided it was time to storm the bank, ordering the special forces to prepare for an armed clash. But when they stormed the place, they found nothing but the hostages laid out on the ground. The police didn't know how the thieves escaped because they hit the hole in the wall before leaving. They assumed the thieves had hidden among the hostages. They detained the hostages outside the bank until they could verify their identities. Finally, after a period of raiding and searching, the police discovered the hole behind the drawers. However, the next problem they encountered was the object in front of them. The bomb squad confirmed that it was just a fake bomb. During all of this, the gang was sitting comfortably at home, watching the events unfold on TV and celebrating their victory. After that, they divided the goods among themselves. Since calculating the exact amounts would take a long time, they divided everything visually. Their spoils were like a small mountain, a mountain of money, gold, and jewelry. The bank estimated that the total value of the loot had reached $19 million. This operation was classified as the largest bank robbery in the history of Argentina.
After they divided the goods among themselves, they agreed that everyone would go their separate ways and never see each other again. Everyone took their share, got into their cars, and went their own way. All were happy, but one would soon lose their joy, and the rest would follow shortly after. The first to experience this downfall was the financier. When he returned home, his children and wife, Elisa, were eagerly waiting for him. Before she even knew about the operation, Elisa had been waiting for her husband enthusiastically, eager for the new fortune that would change their lives forever. That night, they celebrated with their family. Time passed, and one day after leaving the house for a while, the financier returned to find that one of the bags of loot, which had been hidden in a safe, was out of place. Upon opening the bag, he saw that a large sum of money was missing. He went to her wife, Elisa, and asked, Did you take some of the money? Elisa replied, Yes, I took five or six small bags. Keep in mind, these small bags contained approximately $300,000. He then asked, How can you take money like this without telling me? You'll expose us. From there, the argument between them escalated, and he demanded that Alyssa return the money. Alyssa refused, and the quarrel intensified. In the end, he decided to hide the remaining spoils and bags somewhere else, fearing further theft. What he never expected was that her wife, out of spite and jealousy, would go to the police station and report him. Perhaps Alyssa even believed that her husband was cheating on her with another woman, thinking that he would take the money and go to a secret lover, leaving them behind. The reason behind her actions was pure jealousy. Even though the financier didn't have a mistress and had no intention of leaving the family. On the contrary, he loved her family deeply and would never have gone anywhere without them. There are many details of the events that happened after that, but we will not mention them in detail because there is nothing important in them. In short, the financier was arrested, and after his arrest he refused to reveal the identity of his colleagues, but some other evidence, such as tracking phones, which we will not get into in a profound way, led to the discovery of the identities of the four who carried out the operation. A circular and arrest warrants were issued for all of them, but in the end, they were all caught. Fernando, the commander, was hiding in a tent in the middle of a remote, isolated place, but the National Guard patrols were sent to arrest him. The violent man, Louis, even left Argentina and went to Uruguay, his home country, but even there he was arrested. Sebastian the engineer was the easiest one to catch, and he was found sitting in his house. All four of them were caught and put on trial. The strange thing is that most of the spoils were not recovered. The thieves hid them in difficult places and refused to confess. In the end, they were sentenced to between 9 and 15 years, but none of them even completed their sentences. On the contrary, they were all released early on the grounds of good behavior. Fernando and Sebastian served approximately six years, and Louis served eight years, much shorter than the original sentence. Now, the question is, is it plausible to steal millions and face such weak sentences? How were the rulings so lenient? The main reason was the weapons they used. When we told you that their weapons were special, remember also that when they came out of the bank, they placed their weapons on a mattress. The reason was that their weapons were fake. They were not real weapons. Imagine people entering and conducting a huge operation like this, holding hostages, and even being confronted by the police and special forces. The reason they received lenient sentences was that an armed robbery carries a very different punishment compared to an unarmed robbery. And since their weapons were fake, this led to light sentences and early releases. But the strange thing remains that, as we said, most of the spoils were not recovered. We don't know. Perhaps there was a secret deal made by the authorities to return a large portion of the sums in exchange for early release. Otherwise, it would be very strange if they were released without any compensation. No other possibility exists except bribery, but these are just assumptions. God knows what happened behind the scenes. The bank customers were compensated by the bank and insurance companies. In the drama film about this case, and also in a documentary film, the four of them go out and brag about their operation, and they appear to be living their lives comfortably. To be honest, we do not know exactly what happened to the money. The important thing is, that we have reached the end of this story. Do not forget to like, subscribe to the channel, and activate the bell button. These are some awesome clips that you can watch. Thank you for following. We will see you in the next clip.